Um, I'm Barb Rosenstock, and I write nonfiction and historical fiction picture books for kids. I'm a history nerd, and I love the human stories behind the important events and discoveries of our world. Welcome to the Picture Booking Podcast. Here's your author, illustrator, and host, Nick Patton. Hey, Picture Book people. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you enjoy this episode, subscribe to Picture Booking on your podcast app and discover more at picturebooking.com. Now it's time to go inside the Mobile Library Studio on the campus of St. Norbert College for today's talk. Enjoy. I'm going to get, I should ask the first question, but I'm not going to. (laughs) (laughs) I really just okay. in general, I just want to tell you up front that I really like your website. I really like um just as like when I when I come on to an author's website and I know exactly how how you position yourself and how you think about yourself in the world of of children's books. It's so nice to just see how it's just a clear message, you know, wow. from, from a writer. Um wow. I just, that's that's great. I didn't really I don't really th- I know that, but perhaps it's because I worked in advertising and marketing for almost 20 years before I did this. So yeah, um, you just get used to what a message hopefully is and you keep your fingers crossed that you're doing it. Plus, it really just comes out of truth. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I, I just, um, yeah, I, I always, when, when people ask things about, you know, messaging or how do I brand myself or all that kind of stuff, I mean, I'm always just like, be yourself. That's your brand, you know? Right. Yeah. So. Yep. My thing is that I'm not the best at this because I'm not, not, I'm naturally more on the visual side, but it's like, just how can I make this as simple, as clear, as understandable as, pro- as possible? Because if I, if I make it, if it's confusing to, if it's confusing at all, I'm losing people <laughs> and it doesn't right, matter yeah. how fancy it is right. um, to be able to come on to just to be able to see a message and say, Oh, well, there, there it is. That's her mission statement. Right. You know, I mean, that's, a, that's her life's mission here. And it just, you know, it's so clear. It's so nice. It's, I love it. It's great. Yeah. So yeah. I encourage everybody to actually check out your website just to see. Oh, I thanks. just think, I just think it's great. Um, good. good. Thank you. Um, Oh, come on now. You got to ask about my grandpa. I will. Just totally. You hey, to. I'm not going to skip that. <laughs> I'm not skipping that question. You gotta be kidding me. So I was so I was bumping around your website, right? And I I was reading the articles that you've got links to, and there was one article that I just thought was fantastic. And um in there you said, uh, to know why I write biography, you have to have met my grandpa Stan. And I just thought that was now there's a there's a great place to, to start, right? Um right. that's so, where I started. Yeah, exactly. So tell me, tell me, who is this who is Grandpa Stan? Uh. My grandpa, Stanley Sawinski, that was his full name, um, was probably my, not probably, was my favorite person in the whole world. Um, and he was just a, uh, half Polish, half Armenian, uh, kid of immigrants who came to Chicago. His mom and dad came to Chicago. He was an only child, um, unusually because his parents had lost six, five or six children in the old country before they came here. So he was the youngest of seven, but he's the only one that lived. And we would, he, he, I think took a great responsibility in that. Um, of passing down his family stories because of that. And I didn't mean to start out sad there because he was anything but a sta- sad person. Um, he was just a phenomenal storyteller. I don't know where he learned it, you know, what he did. He only, he had about an eighth, sixth or eighth grade education. He may not have even graduated eighth grade. Some people, are just born or learn the, um, a way to draw people in when they speak. And he was one of them. Anything from, he could go to work and come home and just say, guess what I met today? Guess who I met today? Or, oh, come here. Did you ever see somebody who only had one wheel on their car? You know what I mean? He would just start (laughs) right there. And you were like, what? What are you talking about? And you'd have to sit and listen. And, um, I just really, um, every, I've, I literally keep a picture of the two of us. I'm about three 
and he's well into his late fifties or sixties on my desk. It's a little black and white picture. And he is leaning over talking to me while I'm swinging my legs. And I can tell that he's telling me a story. And recently I looked through all these pictures and he is leaning over like that to me in every single picture <laughs> I have of us. And I, um, just use that when I get stuck as a writer, uh, which happens like all the time, like every day. Um, I kind of try to channel him or channel that feeling of come here closer. I want to tell you, I want to tell you about this. Um, so he's just kind of with me. He's just with me in the back of my brain and heart always. Yeah. That's and great. There's always <laughs> those people in your life that are, um, that are just like, so special and to have like to have his thing be something that you end up that you end up channeling for your own career and your own life um the fact that stories are so important to him so did you know i mean were stories and writing always something that that were was part of your life well storytelling in the family yes just family stories they were always kind of true or about history or the guess what we did in the great depression i mean i just came from a family like that that liked to talk about their own <laughs> from a family yeah. that like to talk about themselves. I don't know. But um, as far as writing, though, I was a big reader. My mother was a huge reader. Um, other people, not so much. And But writing to me was like the scariest thing in school. I did not ever, 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 ever think of being a writer as a career, um, especially any kind of creative writing. Like I still don't think of myself in whatever, I, however I'm supposed to think of myself as creative. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I don't feel like I am, you know what I mean? I look at other people and feel like they are, but I don't feel like I am. So, um, that kind of stuff was in school for me was just always really, you know, just scary, you know, okay, you're an alien and they come to our school, you know, well, how is, what's your reaction? I'm like, I don't know what's an alien doing in my school. I just never could do the prompt thing well. And, um, so no, I mean, reading, yes, was part of it. Verbal st oral storytelling in my family was a big part of it, but writing was not on my radar. Never, never, never. <laughs> I feel like, and I, I feel like that's, kind of parallel to my story or just me how I, I relate to that i relate my, my biggest fear and i wasn't i was not a strong reader so my biggest fear was like having to read something or read something out loud was the height the height of awfulness um, <laughs> in school for me but my but my family and i have a great grandpa who sounds like who sounds like the the double gainer, gainer for um, your your grandpa. He's he. There was just so many stories that when that he had, and so many. And I didn't know him very long, but people would tell his stories, and they were just they were just mm -hmm. passed down. Um, do you know what he did here? Yeah. Do you know what he did during the Great Depression? Mm -hmm. You know. You know what he did when, um, uh, when the Nazis came to power and he was a German, so he changed his last name and <laughs> just like all these crazy things that he did. Right. Um, and and, the, and people just light up when they tell when they tell his stories to me and um uh those are so th so you had that foundation of this the strong storytelling but then but then the actual like <laughs> physical part of of becoming a writer that scared you ah huh? that's still scary every day <laughs> That's still scary you can't like like think to me you can't think of it like if you start thinking about it too much like Someone's got to read this, you know, I, I don't know. It just turned, it just kind of turns it around for me. So, so then how do yeah. you, how do you get through that? I mean, how does, how, how, so in the process, I mean, are you doing a lot of writing or are you actually like, I mean, how, how what does the process look like to you? I mean, are you sitting <laughs> My there process. Talk, talking, I'm like, you're talking, yes. you're talking to your, your <laughs> husband, you're talking to your, your animal friends and you're, you're saying, yeah, I got this fun story to tell you. And then you, I, I mean, how is, how does that thing work? How do you how do you overcome those fears to actually sit down and, and produce work? I I am just really obsessive. It's funny. Um, I am not one of those like you must write every day writers. I'm I know that I'm supposed to, or I kind of always feel like I'm supposed to do it that way. But um, I don't. I will go long periods of time where I don't really feel like I have anything to say or any great idea or, you know, I'm just kind of living my life. And then all of a sudden something will strike me or I'll read something and it's like, wow, I need to know more about that. And then, you know, um, actually speaking of husbands, my husband will say, uh oh, 
<laughs> I go, what? And he goes, I can tell something's brewing, you know? And then I will be obsessive. Like I will literally set the alarm for 345 every morning and write from four in the morning till sometimes eight or nine o'clock at night. Um, so I am more of a just, I have to get this on paper and it's more for, there's two different parts of it to me. There's the initial getting it on paper, which is just almost like, I mean, people have said this before. It's almost like vomiting. It's disgusting, but it's almost like vomiting, you know, where you're just like, oh my God, I know this cool thing. And like, here's how I'm going to tell it. And then there's the whole revision process. I happen to be someone who it's scary, but I love revision. Like I love it. It's my favorite part of it is to go back in and kind of like reweave what, what you put down to begin with. And, um, and that's really where all the work is. And, um, and it really isn't until I get through like a really good revision that I think, oh, okay, now someone can read this. Like, you know, now, now I'm okay with somebody else reading it. I also read out loud to the dog. You know, I read out loud, you know what I mean? I'll read right. out loud in my office just in general to myself because you have to hear it that way. And someone, sometimes I think that's like what beginning writers like miss the most is that even if it's nonfiction or, you know, like what more along the lines of what I do, a picture book has to be able to be read out loud easily and keep the audience. Yeah. And it, it's just essential. So, yeah. When you were, when you're talking, I was just visualizing, I never thought about it like this, but it's like when he's vomiting, it was not what I was visualizing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> but no, it was, it's this, this idea that, you know, like you, it's like you're building, it's almost like you're growing, how do I want to, I don't know, I don't know, I'm developing this metaphor as I'm, as I'm talking, but it's like, it's like a tree, right? But you're actually, you're actually growing the tree and then you come in and you carve what you're going to carve into that tree or the block of wood, right? But you're actually the one, so the first draft is actually like the tree growing and then you're going to go in and you're going to, you're going to carve out the story that's inside there through your editing. Right. Um, right. It's, I think of it actually as like a big fat lump of clay. A bunch yeah. of word, mm -hmm. uh, like a big set of words that are like a lump of clay. And when you look at a lump of clay, what do you say? After the, you've got a lump of, like, say you had to make your own clay, right? So you're making, you make your own clay and you make it out of whatever, whatever clay is made out of. I don't know, dirt and water. I don't right, know. Right. Um, and there you go. And then now you've got a big bowl of clay, right? Well, like now what are you going to do? Right. And that is like, to me, that's the essential question in a picture book is like, so now you've got it, especially nonfiction to me or historical fiction is like, you know, cause people think it's like a lot of facts and it's really not, that's not the, the process is now you got a big bowl of clay. So, which is like your research, right? I got a big bowl of clay. I'm going to turn it over on the table. Well, it's nothing. So what that you have a big bowl of clay? Like that's not a book. The clay is not a book at all. What is starts to become a story or a book is, you know, is that carving that you were talking about? You know what I mean? It's like that sculpting. I mean, I really do have literally some mornings um, I will have the sense that I'm literally physically like carving away words into a shape. And nobody, obviously, outside looking at me would say that. But in my head, it's definitely got that same sense of like having a sculpting tool and a big pile of clay and starting to carve away at it and get it into some shape that's going to make sense, that's going to communicate something. It's got a lot of like shape or tactile things to me writing, at least in my head. Mm -hmm. So it's weird. Yeah, can you? Is that weird? No, 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 no. I, that totally makes sense, and I, I totally picked up on that in your first, yeah. in, in the first little bit that you're talking about there. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be interesting. To, so, so talk a little bit more about that. That it's not just, um, it's it's not just the facts that you're just trying. You're not trying to. It's not just the facts that you're trying to lay out on someone's someone's life. You're trying. You're trying to tell. You're trying to tell a story in a different way. Um, so let's just, just walk me through that. What does that, what does that mean for you? Well, I don't like, like just to talk about, like, just to start with, um, like leave it to Abigail. All right. I don't start, I don't have a giant list of like famous people running around. Like, you know, the way that you kind of were taught to do biographies in a, in a, in school, you remember, like they would right. give you a list, like here's some people you could write about. And then you, <laughs> you know, decide who that is. Um, I don't have that list that it does not exist. A lot of times people will come up to me and go, so who are you writing about next? And I, they probably think I'm like, I don't know 
dense or something because my answer is I don't know you know all of these what happens with my with my stories for me is that there's some connection that is made and it's the person comes after the connection I don't look at a person first I look at the connection first um, for example let me think about this I was at the baseball hall of fame all right and saw the saw the bat that DiMaggio used and it's the bat and that physical experience of learning that the bat was stolen that became a biography of Joe DiMaggio. I didn't even know anything about Joe DiMaggio and he would have never been on one of my radar as someone to write about. So um, for Abigail, she kept coming up in my research just as a human being. You know what I mean? Like Ben, I did Ben Franklin. I did a book on Thomas Jefferson. Abigail was in that research, you know, just as a human being um, in that time. And, um, and the only thing I remembered about her was that she had like done what did she, she like wash the laundry in the White House or something? I don't know. Some weird little fact. And I just kept thinking, well, you know, it would be cool to do a book about a woman, but laundry, you know, like right. that's hardly a kid's topic, you know, <laughs> and it just kind of was like, eh, I'm not doing that, you know, um, but came to the realization that like I was in the East Coast and um had passed the Adams house. And I thought, all right, I'm going in the Adams house. And as soon as I walked in there, I'm like, people, she really lived here. Like it was seeing the objects and seeing the fact that I um, was brought up by a mother and had a father that was absent um, quite a bit of the time off and on. And, um, and in this tour of Abigail's home, they mentioned that John was never home. And it was that connection, that first connection. I was like, oh, my gosh, this woman raised four children on her own during the American Revolution. You know, that was like, wait a minute, that's a little bit more intense than the laundry. And then it just kind of goes from there. Then I just start reading and reading her letters. And, you know, I don't know. That's kind of what the process is about. And I'm not even sure that's the question you asked me, quite frankly. No, but I love it. <laughs> it is It is the question. It is definitely the question. <laughs> it's so interesting that, yeah, I mean, that's it. You're looking, and it's just it was like the first answer that you gave me about, like, how you're not sitting down and writing every day. You're really looking for where your curiosity leads you. And, and once you, once something, once you're interested in something, then you pursue that instead of saying you're not, so you're not writing, you're not writing these books because that's what you do for a living. <laughs> Even though that's well, what you do is, for a living. Yeah. <laughs> right. But you're writing, but if you're writing these books because you're curious about something in, in the world. And right. you're discovering and I don't, it. Yeah. And I don't even write biography because I write biography. It's almost like that's the way I see things is through this, the people's end of it. I see it as who did it as opposed to what happened. And that's just a way of, I don't know why. Like, I don't know why that's, I'm just drawn to who did it, not what happened. Yeah. Um, so I don't think of even my, you know, people like, Oh, you write a lot of biographies. I probably wrote 10 before I even realized that. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess they all are sort of, you know. I mean, I know that sounds stupid, but it's true. You know, I don't think of them. I don't sit down to write a biography. I see, I sit down to write almost like a family story of an event that I thought was cool from the, through the lens of the person who did it or the person who was most involved, I yeah. guess. You know, I don't know. And it, but it's a great way of, I mean, it's a great way of learning. Um, because it's, it, I mean, just like studying biographies is a great way of learning because you get to, cause they have more than, than just the, they have more than just the facts, right? About a person, you get to kind of see like, even in the, even in the children's book stuff that you're doing, you get to see the life, right? And the normalcy sometimes of, of a life and you get to put yourself in there and think, well, this, this is something you could see how. If you just if you just flip to the end of Abigail's story in your book here and you look at what she did while Adams was a president, you think, wow, how do you how do you, how do you get to that point? But through this whole book, you know, you're showing us how someone who starts out as as us, you know, can mm. as as just a normal person living <laughs> a normal life can can slowly build um the strength to, to, to have a moment where, she, where she's one of the most powerful political figures in the country. Um, 
that's in in her, in the time that we're talking about, right? It's right. It's right. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it is amazing. And, you know, I think I I don't remember who said this, but, you know, that the famous like Abe Lincoln didn't know he was going to be Abe Lincoln. Right. Right. You know, and I think that kids what biographies do um, and I I guess how I would use them if I was, you know, teaching is um, also that, you know, they're they're just like great um, introductions to whole time periods. And I mean, I just think it's fascinating. I guess I feel like that whole, like there's little baby Abe Lincoln, you know, and he doesn't know he's going to be Abraham Lincoln, you know, or he doesn't, you know, he doesn't know he's going to be Martin Luther King. You know, he doesn't know, you know, Mm -hmm. he's just a kid. Mm -hmm. And when I look like when I read at schools and stuff, and when I look at those faces, that is just like such a cool idea that is in my head all the time. Like you don't know what third grader in this room is going to do some amazing thing, you know, and probably most of them are going to do something, right. you know, which is cool. And, you know, there could be, you know, one in every class or, you know, that does something amazing or influences, you know, or, you know, cures cancer or, or mothers, the person who cures cancer, you know what I mean? It's kind of all the same difference, you know, right, it's right. like everybody's got their little country, you know, the, the whole idea about the human story, I kind of feel like in general, like humanity, I mean, history is really just all of our individual little stories put together in my brain. You know, that's all it is. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's what every single human being from before when we were, you know, scratching on cave walls comes together and brings to the table and how that all interacts and how that all maps together. So, you know, that's just how I think of biography is just how I think about history. It's not what I'm initially like what I'm trying to write. Yeah. I don't know. That's cool. awesome. That's awesome. I like it. I like people. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I know we've we've talked about leave it to Abigail. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Do you want to do like a little introduction? Um, I know it's kind of like in the middle. Oh my goodness, an introduction. Um, well, leave it to Abigail is the story of one of our founding mothers. Um, how she grew up, how she supported her family, and why she's important to our country. And it kind of just um, goes through how. In a lot of ways, specifically through Abigail's um, life, that, you know, this whole idea of a founding father, well, nobody was able to, none of them would have been able to do that without the founding mothers in their lives. And um, we've kind of lost track of that. And it's it's about girls and, oh gosh, can you tell him we're really, really, really bad at that elevator pitch thing? <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> no. I'm just wandering around here. No, no, no. Anyway, that's what it's about. Yeah. It's about Abigail Adams. <laughs> Exactly. But, (laughs) um, you know, when you, so when you, when you're telling a story, someone's life story or even a biography, sometimes it's just like only, only a part of their life. But here in, in Abigail's story, you you kind of chose to show, to show her whole life from Mm -hmm. her birth to her retirement. Why did you feel like that was an important, an important thing to include the whole breadth of, of everything she experienced? Because that is who she is. I don't, it, that seems, um, that's kind of nebulous. Um, because that to me was the so what of the story was how dang much she did. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I was just like, whoa, like, this isn't someone who, like, oh, all right. So, you know, she's, she's a little girl and she, you know, learned how to do everything by hand. I mean, when you go and, and if you're able ever, if anybody's ever able to like see Abigail's like, you know, house and stuff like that. I mean, so this is literally someone who could can peaches and plant a garden and, you know, weave cloth and do all of that physical, hard, physical woman's work labor that was, you know, in her era. Right. Then she, and she's also though a huge reader, who kind of sneaks off, loves to eavesdrop on the adults, is not, is like within the society yet kind of knows that there's, she's got a spark inside and she isn't kind of willing to sit in the box exactly. You know, she's willing to play in the box if you need her to, but boy, she would really like to get out of it. Um, and then she just goes on, marries this man that no one thinks is going to be much of anybody, <laughs> quite frankly, especially <laughs> her parents, um, marries him anyway, which kind of wasn't, you know, which probably didn't go over 100 percent at the time. He becomes 
he starts to become who he starts to become. But I mean, she's doing everything. She's like balancing his law books and reading some of his work and ba- bouncing a baby. And, you know, the idea of how modern Abigail Adams seemed to me, it just, you know, that whole idea of like that women juggle work. I mean, all of us juggle work. Do, women do tend to juggle more in, in a lot of di- more different areas, typically not, you know, not a hundred percent of the time, but typically. And, um, boy, Abigail was just a modern, modern woman. And then she's a businesswoman, And then she's basically supporting the family because John's really bad with money. And, you know, and then yet, and yet, you know, what do I, what have I heard about her over and over? Even as someone who reads a lot of history, she hung laundry in the white house. And I'm like, what? Yeah. You know, that is the least, I mean, and I don't even know if it's true. I actually never even really looked up if that was true. I'm going to have to do that now. But, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it had to be a breath book because that's what it was about. It was about how someone's entire life was just so dang interesting and competent and how in every area of her life, people relied on her, you know, her family, her children, her husband, the country, you know, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, you know, everybody was asking for advice and relying on her throughout her whole life. So when you start I'm sort of a fan, can you tell? I'm yeah, a and, like woohoo, Abigail. <laughs> I know, and it, you just sort of, um, and you know, you, your chorus in here, where you 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 say like, you tend to say things. Well, the first line, the first end of the first uh, page of text this is, everyone knows that good 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 girls keep quiet, and then you say, leave it to Abigail. You keep yeah. you keep showing like, so this is the traditional way that people think about putting a, a a woman in a box and this is how she p- pushed through that and how she, um, how she just, you know, <laughs> did what needed to get done in order to, to, to live this amazing life. It's just, it's, right. Yeah. I think, yeah, the, you know what you, what you just said is true. You, it, I really like writing. I really liked writing about her because she, I think in some ways she just really seemed like she was herself. It's like, you know how, you know, people kind of talk now about like, you know, make sure little girls have, you know, a, more confidence that they tend to lose that. Abigail was someone, her parents must have done a good job. I don't know if it was her mom or her dad or she, it was just an inborn thing, but Abigail just was herself and seemed to, you know, just do, like you said, do what needed to get done um, to fulfill herself and to fulfill the duties and the things that she thought were important in her life. And that certainly was also her marriage and her family. You know, she wasn't like... Hey, I'm going to go off and live in Paris in a garret and, you know, wear pants. I mean, that's, you know, she lived within her society and managed to be pretty, pretty happy most of the time. So, yeah. so what was it? So as you're, as you're starting off, I, I can't, I can't imagine that, like, I, I can't imagine like going through, like not knowing a whole lot about her, visiting her house, thinking this is interesting. And then as you like go down that rabbit hole of like finding out, who she really was. What was that? What was that like? What was studying her like? Um, it was overwhelming because of the breadth of information. It was like, I knew I wanted to do a picture book. I love the format. I love working with artists. So, you know, this could have been, this still could be if anybody, any middle grade people are out there, any middle grade nonfiction people out there, like write it. Cause there's certainly enough information there. I just, it was cramming so much information into, you know, not very many words. And I was so afraid that I was going to lose it. And in fact, at one point, the book really was only going to be about one thing, which um, was the, the trip, the ship trip between when she leaves the United States and goes to Europe. I almost wrote a book just about Abigail on a boat um, more than once. That's what I thought. That's what I thought it was going to be. And, um, it just wasn't looking at because I thought it was just the coolest, funniest thing that she gets on a ship with, you know, I mean, sailors in 1780 or 1790, whatever it was. You know, I mean, we're not talking like yeah. you know, it's a pretty tough crowd. Right. <laughs> and she's a woman in skirts and, you know, she's going to be the ambassador's wife. And, you know, she gets on there and she's like, oh, no, this is not going to do. This ship is filthy. I'm not eating worms in my food. 
You know, like she just kind of, you know, starts, you know, she's like everybody's favorite aunt or everybody's aunt that they're afraid of one or the other or a combination <laughs> of both. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Where she's like, oh, no, honey, we're not doing it this way. You know, <laughs> like, nope. And she goes into the kitchen, kicks out the ship cook, says you, you and you start mopping this deck. I'm not living like this. Unpack my dishes. We're using mine. I'm not. You know what I mean? That is just a woman, a powerful woman in charge who knows what she will and will not stand for. And I almost wrote the whole book like that. But um, what happened is at one point I went back and was taken on a tour of the homes in in detail when they were closed to the public um, by one of our National Park Service um, people, Carolyn Keenis, who is a deputy supervisor at the Adams National Park. And we got to I got to go in all kinds of places where people don't usually go get to go, including up in the attic. And Carolyn knows a lot. She kept telling me stories. Talk about being with my grandpa Stan. She, Carolyn was like a great Adams family storyteller. I mean, she knows everything. So she's telling me all these stories. And then finally I looked at her and I go, oh my gosh, leave it to Abigail. Like, did she like invent like the microscope or something? Like I was just like (laughs) astonished at what I was learning. And then that idea, like leave it to Abigail. That's what everyone was doing. The idea of leave it to Abigail. She's going to do what she wants to do. And also how much she was left to Abigail to figure it out. You know, um, that's kind of how it began to organize itself into a book that covered her from literally birth, like literally she's an infant on page one to a retiree and at the end. So, um, that's kind of how it, I don't know. It's just a process. I guess it is a process. I, even though I don't like that word. <laughs> um, it's so good. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks. So, was there, is there something that stands out even, that made the book or didn't make the book that really surprised you about her life? The business stuff really surprised me. I didn't know. Um, she was a, she started importing, she started an import business during the Revolutionary War, <laughs> <laughs> which you just don't think of. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, right. I, you don't think of that. Um, she was wasn't making very much money. I mean, John obviously was when they were all, you know, writing the documents and, you know, being founding fathers, it wasn't like they could practice law at the same time back home. Right. So it wasn't a lot of money coming in. And um, she realized being a woman living among a lot of other women whose, you know, men were off either fighting or, you know, speaking or whatever, that she, that women were really missing some of the fine things of life that they could no longer get. And, um, since John was across the ocean, she's began to get this idea like, John, go, go to get, find me a box of handkerchiefs in France and send that over here, you know? And she really did like start an import business, you know, like handkerchiefs, lace, um, things that women couldn't get here that they were used to getting from England, from Great Britain and couldn't get anymore. And, um, so Abigail would import them like giants amounts of them and then sell them at a profit. Um, and this is in an age when women did, couldn't sign a contract, you know, she had to have relatives, you know, kind of like pretend like they were signing off for her and things like that. It's just, it's amazing to me that she, um, made money, you know, and, and John would go, what are we going to do for money, Abigail, which meant Abigail figure it out, you know, in his <laughs> letter. So it's pretty amazing. That's awesome. This yeah. is such an amazing person. Can you, um, let's talk a little bit about these illustrations because uh, there's so, <laughs> they cool? there's so much good stuff. I'll just, I still don't know how Elizabeth did that, like the actual like cross cross stitch look thing. Yeah, is she really? Like, how did she do that? Like, I'm, I still have to ask her. In fact, I, I in fact, I'm going to get off this interview and literally send an email going. Wait a minute, exactly how did this work? Because yeah, I mean, if anyway, you read her, if you read her notes, I think she actually. I mean, we could be misspeak. I think she. This is actual cross stitching that she did. No, she could not have. Right? Not the whole book. No, not the whole. I don't know. The whole background. Did she do it? I mean, I she know. does cross stitch. I know that. And actually, she's thinking about putting together a pattern of remember the lady. So if there's any cross stitchers out there, there may be a pattern by Elizabeth Badley, like a cross stitch pattern that you could actually sketch the book. So maybe she did. I don't know. I got to find out. Okay, we'll have to. Well, we'll Do you think to, these are like pictures of actual cross stitch? I don't know. I don't know. It's wow. Anyway, go ahead. Never mind. <laughs> no, <laughs> you I think we're I all going to be now, quiet. Right? You get no. everybody else has got to go get the book, and then we can all stare at the book together. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, why don't you? Let's just talk. Could just tell me what 
Let's talk about one spread because that's either or one illustration that you just really found um, profound or, or powerful or interesting in the book. Because, maybe because I have sons, there is an illustration that actually doesn't is a little bit different than a lot of the rest of the book. It's the illustration right in the middle um, of there's two ships and there's Abigail and John and her son, uh, John Quincy. Um, and he's saying goodbye to his mother. And I don't know, that one just really got me. I mean, a lot of them did, but that one really got me. And I think it's because I knew how, you know, when you left in that, in those days, that, you know, lots of people didn't come back. Lots of people didn't come back and to leave and to see how young he was, the, her son at that point, you know, she's taller than him. I mean, he was a 10 year old boy, I believe that, that, that one just was really emotional for me, but that's probably as a mother, not as a reader or certainly not as a writer. So what's your favorite one? Well, let's just, uh, I don't want to stick a little moment and talk about this one that you've right. picked out too. I really, I mean, you're right. It is different than just about any other, the any other illustrations in this book where she's, mm -hmm. She's really like it's all monotone except for, except for for her and her son and and John, and, I think. Yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's really, um, yeah, it just feels it's it's a quiet moment that you're talking about where you just don't know what's going on. I think it, it's super powerful. Yeah, yeah. I just really like that um, that um, Elizabeth made that choice. You know what I mean? Because the rest of the book isn't the rest of the book does kind of move along at that clip. Like the language is pretty clippy, like leave it to Abigail. She sold the dot, da, 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 you know, noun, right. verb, noun, verb, noun, verb. It's like very action, 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 action oriented. And I like that Elizabeth took the time in her art to really give us a, a, a feeling and not just an action. Um, because even I, I got to say, even in my words, it's still more action oriented. Do you know what I'm saying? And she really pulled out of that an emotion that really touched me. So, yeah. And there's so much, I mean, there's so much going on in the words and then her, her illustrations just, they tend that you I mean, you could gloss over some of them and think, okay, yeah, yeah, that's great. But she's really doing a lot of smart things. Um, but I, I, let me just pick one. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll st otherwise I'll keep going. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking of which one I'm going to pick now. Cause I was switching my mind. Um, <laughs> But uh, the one that I like is um, when uh, the text is John wrote articles support, supporting colony rights. And and th she shows – that's the beginning of that paragraph. And she shows John um, in the middle ground um, and Abigail's in the, in the foreground reviewing his work, mm, um, mm -hmm. holding holding a baby, mm -hmm. and, and just the look, of, look on her face. So usually – like this is this is – this represents this book to me because – John's really in the background and she's in the foreground where normally you tell the story and it's like, you know, John's, John's the big famous hero. He's the president of the United States. And then mm -hmm. in the background, there's this person who's helping him along. Right. Where in, the where, woman behind the famous man. Right. Where right. here, right. she reversed that. And this, in she's the engine driving, <laughs> the, dr driving this train. And, she's, and she was. And, I would argue that she was. That there's no founding father, John Adams, without Abigail. He doesn't yep. exist. Yep. And that's what your you book. Know? I think. I, I mean, you don't. You don't plainly go out and say that in this book, but every inch of this book kind of screams that. That, right. that that she is that John Adams isn't John Adams without her. No, not even close. You and, know. Yeah, and just the, her look, and you just uh, we talked about like multitasking and everything and all the things right. that she was going to do. And you just seen it on her face that she had this, she had this covered and she was, this, this was, she was in her element here and she could do it all. <laughs> and I right. And she was happy, you know, in a way that it was like, I get to use my brain. I get to be a mother. I mean, Abigail was a, you know, was a very good mother and a natural mother. And she wasn't really kind of, that was something that she uh, took a lot of joy um, from and she also was a natural writer and a and a avid reader and she took a lot of joy there too and she was someone who didn't who seemed to be able to um, not really you know buy into that either or um, you know and why would anybody uh, jeez it just well, drives me crazy you have, some people because some people have to you yeah. know or some people you know don't whatever and time and money I mean they did you know she. They did well enough at some point that they had money to, you know what I mean? There's all kinds of reasons, but, um, yeah, I just, I really liked that she was, she was very strong. I can tell too that, I mean, Elizabeth has you very young children, uh, one or, or two, maybe only one. I don't remember. And, um, 
I can tell like I was like when I got that illustration, I was like, oh, there's Elizabeth badly knowing what it's like to be carrying a baby and putting a pen in her mouth. too. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? uh-huh. Like, OK, I'm drawing and you're you know, I, I can't tell. Like, the kid looks half like like Elizabeth didn't want to decide if he was laughing, crying or right on the edge of either. You know, he's kind of uh, not exactly happy, but I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Um, but that's it, you know, and that is what Abigail did. And it's what John, to his credit, although sometimes, you know, you, you kind of want to go, wow, why didn't he let her write the legal briefs or let her go to law school? I mean, that just wasn't even in the you know realm of possibility. Um, he did seriously like say, Abigail, look at this. I don't write well without you. You know, he knew mm-hmm. he knew. So, um, that, that was, it was cool, too, the relationship between them. And that, that comes out in their letters, like just, you know, which have been written about and and filmed and all kinds of things, you know, many, many, many times. But quite a marriage there. Yeah. And such an amazing book. So thank you. Thank you yeah. for uh, – it's so fun to get to bring um, – you know, we read a ton of books. And, you know, we do read um, nonfiction. But uh, nonfiction like this where we get to say, you know – where we get to walk you just like her life, you know, we, this is a baby and here's a, here is her as a kid. And then as you just watch your, your kids, like just try to understand that this is, this is real. We get to, we get to walk through it. We get to talk through it. We get to read it again. Um, I just love, I love this book. It's, it's, oh, uh, thank you. Something that we've enjoyed in our family. So thank you. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank uh, you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a couple the, more questions if you don't okay. mind. Um, yeah. No. Who's in your family that liked the book? Wait, I got to ask you a question. Now. You can edit this out if you want to. <laughs> well, um, we had, well, my, my wife liked it, which is, is, we've ran into a couple, a couple books recently that sometimes, I, I'll t- so I should just tell you that people know this who listen to the podcast, yeah. but a lot of times we don't agree <laughs> on what, on picture books. We'll, we'll say, I'll really love something and she'll say, ah, you know, that's just okay. It's okay. Right, right. But lately, um, when we both love something, I'm like, okay, no, that's a book that I need to, I need to, <laughs> I need to have this author on because we both agree that this is something that's special. And then, um, you know, I just, my, my son's a little young, but I, I am, ex- my daughter's six. So she's, she understands that this is a real person and, um, you know, that she's going to study the presidents. She studied, you know, in general, she's starting to study the presidents. She knows what a president is at all. So we get to talk about, she gets to learn about this history of the Revolutionary War through Abigail Adams, which I love. I mm. love showing her that. And I, lo- I will love just as much showing my son this too, when, mm-hmm. as he starts learning uh, about this stuff. Um, so. I just think it's a, it's a great way of learning, like you said, a great way of learning history. Now she's going to go in to a class eventually and they're going to talk about the Revolutionary War and they're going to talk about the Declaration of Independence. And she's going to have this knowledge of this person in the back of her head throughout that, all that. Um, yeah. And personally, I would rather have her have it first being a girl from mm-hmm. a girl's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think it's important. You know what I mean? All the whole, it, it's just important. It's not a bunch of, it, it was not just a bunch of boys in a room, you know, making a, making a country and the girls stayed home and hung the laundry. <laughs> you know, it's right. like it wasn't, right. you know, um, so it's cool. I mean, not, not that they weren't the writers because they were, but, you know, everybody pitched in. Do you know what I mean? I mean, a revolution is something that does not happen because one person decides it does. You know, there's a there's a. Yeah. So and, and, anyway, good, I'm glad. And uh, this just makes me think of. I don't know where I heard this or, but I was, it was, must have been, it was probably a podcast or a book or something. I have no idea where this came from, but just the, when there's revolution, when there's war, it really is, it really is the women in that society that are just making sure that life still happens. Like you're still going to school, you're still learning, the kids are still, you know, all that through, and in this book, you see that where she is, she's still a mother. And she's still raising her kids and, and she's doing all this other stuff, but that's, she's keeping everything going so that, right. so that he, he, he's freed up to do whatever guys do. Right. right. But right. she's, she's making sure that their family is, is, is together and, and they get what they need. Her family gets what they need and she's doing everything else on top of that too, which man, I don't know. Right. Which then, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's um, that's the, the part of women's work that has not been valued, you know. And um, and I guess I've been thinking like so much. I mean, like a lot of people, I might be kind of pretty I may, may even be like late to the party. But um, I've been thinking a real lot about what. Well, whose history doesn't get told and doesn't get focused on? And, you know, obviously people of color many, 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 many times. And, you know, and women, you know, we, we're really used to seeing the world through, you know, a certain viewpoint. And I've just been thinking about that a lot. So I think, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's just kind of a random thought. No, no. But I, it's important. You know, and to me, it's like it's really important. Like, well, what were the what were the other people doing besides this guy that you're talking about who was talking about himself? Well, of course, he's talking about himself. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, he's the guy who wrote the letter. Of course, he's talking about himself. But, you know, like who was at home? Like and, and what were they doing? And, you know, wait, you know, who made the bullets? Right. Abigail right. made bullets, made bullets in her st- <laughs> in her Sto- not stove. That's my, my modern word for it. Inner fireplace. You know what I mean? Like you cook over an open fire, right? right? right. She had bullet mold. I saw Abigail Adams' bullet mold still exists in the world. And it, he's like, okay, here's my handkerchief and here's my bullet mold. I mean, when you <laughs> saw those two things juxtaposed against each other doing research, it was like, holy goodness, this is a woman to be reckoned with. Yeah. Who had a lace handkerchief and a bullet mold. And use them both. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, wow, that is, that's, that's saying something right there. So. And I think, you know, I mean, what, what's so great about, like, she's amazing and, and, and she's special. But what she does is it just trickles down to everybody else. So you, you just think, so there's all these soldiers that aren't the famous. They're not going to become, they're, they're not going to become presidents. They're just soldiers. But we all, we celebrate them just as well. But the flip side of it, there's Abigail, there's Abigail's with every one of those soldiers too, you know, that are, that are keeping society going, that right. are doing everything that needs to happen so that the soldiers get what they need. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah it's just, you need to, you need to celebrate the whole. Uh, of, of of a society, and I think that's what you're talking about here. Where, um, and it's so great that you know we can we can lament about where we are at, but the fact that we that I think everybody's a lot of people are are a lot more aware of this stuff, and and it's just we we do live in a society that that allows us to 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 have these conversations and and to open up and. And, and to explore and to, and to disagree. Um, mm-hmm. and I just think conflict is, you know, it's, it's, gr- conflict is great because the alternative is not to have conflict, not to be able to, to tell these stories. And that's more like suppression than anything else. Right, so, right. Conflict is where you learn, you know what I mean? I think that that's where you learn things is to listen to other people, you know, talk about things from a perspective that you have no experience from. Right. And and just the fact that the only thing that, you know, obviously I couldn't do my job, neither could you without the internet and all, and that, all the technology that we now rely on every day. One of the things that I do think that, you know, some of it has, um, that we've lost a little bit is just with the whole marketing to, you know, narrow audiences that we don't get to talk. Um, we don't get as much generic information. You know, every day when I hit my Google, it's showing me, you know, things that agree with Barb Rosenstock. And every day, you know, you're getting stuff that agrees with you. And, mm-hmm. you know, Mary down the street's getting hers. You know what I mean? And the problem with that is that it's reinforcing everything that I already think about myself. But it is not really getting me out. Of, you know, I'm not saying anything that no one hasn't said a million times before. But, you know, like we really do have to break a bubble. Like, you know, what I think people did back then is that they did argue But they had to argue face to face, you know what I mean? And they didn't, and they, and smart people actively sought out and I hope still seek out opinions that don't agree with them. You know, and that's one thing from doing biographies that I really, really, really notice is that these people who did, you know, great things in all these different places, for the most part, they didn't spend a lot of time um, with information that wasn't challenging to them. You know, they, they literally sought out from a lot of times people and, and or information books, whatever, that really kind of went against what they thought or against what they brought up. Like they wanted to see the whole broad picture and then came to their discovery or their, um, you know, life's work or whatever it was. And I just think that that's a really great role model. You know, I mean, I get a lot of my own like, 
open yourself up a little bit, role modeling from the stuff that I write. You know what I mean? Just come mm-hmm. from seeing, you know, what some of the letter, the actual historical letters and documents are. You know, S- smart people have never, not smart and accomplished people have never spent a lot of time only reading stuff that agreed that they already agreed with. Right. They just don't. Well, how boring. That's cool. That's good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. It's kind of like, ah, there I am again. <laughs> yeah. If you're actually interested in, in, well, if you think you're right, how do you know you're right unless you right. battle test it against exactly uh, against other opinions and other thoughts and which is like the sci- scientific method, right? Of let's try to well, I've got a theory now I'm going to see if it works. You're going to try to break it in all the different ways that it can get broke, um, and if it stands the test of time, then you've got something, right? But that's right. that's a process that you have to go to 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 figure it out. And yeah, how. How? Yeah, it's almost like we're a little fragile now. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like we're a little fragile. We don't want to put our, you know, we just want to have our idea and we want to put it out there. And we want everyone to go, yay, what a great idea. You know, we don't want to slap our ideas or whatever inventions or whatever against, you know, cold reality of someone saying, yeah, did you ever think about this? You know, um, whereas before, and maybe it was just that life wasn't as easy back then. I don't really know. You know, I'd have to think about that a long time before I came up with like, a, <laughs> this is the Barb Rosenstock statement on this. But, you know, I think they were used to adversity just in regular, like literally getting up in the day. You knew a lot of dead people that like, people didn't live, you know, serious adversity, you know, right. food wasn't was poisoned and you had to work really hard to get it. I mean, big things um, that, you know, they weren't really as afraid or as fragile with their own thoughts. It was like, all right, tell me what's wrong with this. I'm fine with that. You know, now let's see. Let's see if we can get through it. So, and I think that's cool. It yeah. doesn't bother me at all. Well, I think we solved the world's problems. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we could end now. <laughs> If the world was only 32 pages long. <laughs> yes, I could uh, solve the problem if it was 32 pages long. <laughs> anyway. So what's uh, what's next for you? I know you've got a book that's coming out relatively, is it the same yeah, time? Yeah, right at the end of February. And it's another book about a lady. Um, it's called Fight of the Century. Um, Alice Paul battles Woodrow Wilson for the vote. And it is about another, un- un- totally coincidentally, that they came out in the same year, but um, and, and that they're both about women, but, um, Alice Paul is, was a suffrage, was just suffragist. Uh, this year is the hundredth anniversary of the ratification of the 19th amendment. Alice Paul is the person who made that happen, that amendment happen. Um, and it literally is set up like a boxing match. If you haven't seen it, um, literally like a boxing match. Um, Alice has people in her corner and she is fighting Woodrow, who has people in his corner. And we go back and forth in three rounds until someone wins. Um, can so I, it's, can I ask a question? I know I shouldn't ask a question. Yeah, no, no, you, can I ask a question? So how did that idea? I mean, obviously, <laughs> how did a boxing match? How did yeah. how did that idea come out of out of? that story okay alice paul was the 19th amendment which a a friend gave me a pair of uh, voting earrings um or i saw a pair of voting earrings actually gave them to her now that i think about this story in the right order and um i thought oh voting gosh why when when when, when did women vote you know and then it was like oh the 100th anniversary is coming up all right i think i might have to try to find a story so that's what i mean by like an interest first person later it's Mm -hmm. not i want to write about alice paul anyway um the boxing match came about because I'm reading all this stuff about Alice Paul and I realized like she's the first person who organized a protest at the White House that didn't exist before the silent sentinels. And she really was a fighter. Do you know what I mean? Like when I had heard the whole like, you know, the uh, well, I knew this, but I didn't really read about it until I was researching for this book. I mean, these women were jailed and beaten and spit on in the street. I mean, that is not. You know, the suffragist in uh, Mary Poppins, you know what I mean? He's like putting on her silk sash and going down and then, you know, (laughs) having tea. Um, (laughs) That was it was in some ways and in a lot of in a lot of times kind of a street fight that they were trying not to hit back on exactly like. You know, kind of like the the civil rights era, Martin Luther King, Mm -hmm. you know, type things like the the. Um, why am I blanking on what that is called? Um, I want to say it's passive resistance and that is completely not right. Um, Um, not nonviolence or nonviolent reaction, but there's like another, there's a verb there. But anyway, um, you know, they were doing a lot of that also. And I just found that fascinating. 
is like, is there a way to fight? What's a fight really about? Oh, a fight's like a boxing match. Is it, could it be round one? Could this whole thing be divided into big chunk? Like, could you take the whole suffragist movement from Alice Paul and divide it into only three rounds? And so I did. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. It was a way to organize, you know, picture books, need an organization, an organizing principle. Um, and that, you know, sometimes when you come up with one, it, you should probably just nod your head and start writing it that way, you know, because uh, the, the alternative is just a mess of, like I said, a max, mess of unmixed clay. And that, that doesn't really usually tend to come out very well. So yeah, it's a fight. Cause it was a fight. You know, it was a fight. And it was a fight of this century. It was the biggest fight of, well, last century, I guess, technically, right? This century, no, because it's 100 years this year, so it's still this century. So mm-hmm. um, it was the biggest fight of the century. I mean, when you when it was ranked, you know, when things, you know, there's a lot of like Pew and all kinds of polls, um, you know, what were the most important events of the um, of the century? I think it, I think World War II just edges out women voting. So it was a fight of the century. Very I just cool. repeated myself 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> we'll edit all of them out. Yeah, this please. whole part's going to just get cut. No, yeah, whatever out. you do is what you do. <laughs> so uh, I got one final question for you, and yeah. that is, what's been uh, the best moment of your picture book life? Well, you know, getting to go to the, Cal- the Caldecott banquet was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that does, that's not bad. It's not a bad moment. <laughs> Not a bad one. Um, and the Orvis Pictus this year was pretty cool, too. That honor was pretty cool, too, this year. So um, those were cool. But um, I have to go with something that just happened like this week because it's on my brain. There is a class in Arizona. Shout out to the class. Um, Julie Waugh's class in Arizona that um, used the Secret Kingdom in a way that just made my whole year. Um, uh, the Secret Kingdom is a book I wrote. It's about a man named Nek Chand, uh, who in India built the largest outsider art installation in the world out of recycled materials. But when the students read the book, were learning about India, I used the book to learn about India, which is great. Um, but when they found out that his artwork, uh, Chand's artwork, the Rock Garden of Chandakar, is still in danger of being destroyed, they started a Save the Secret garden project and wrote persuasive letters and actually has now sent them in big batches to government officials in India, right around the rock garden. Um, and now they are sending them to the press in India, trying to um, use their voices to actually affect a real change in the world. And I guess any of my books, inspiring kids to work on their own dreams or do anything good in the world is like the best part of being able to do this job. So that right now is the best thing that has ever happened. That something I wrote about could have inspired kids to then save the thing that I wrote about is just that's a good day, week, month, year, career. I'm done. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you enjoy this episode, subscribe to Picture Booking on your podcast app and discover more at picturebooking.com. Bye-bye, everybody.